feel very like vampy. Like I feel like this should be my alternate ego of like like a vampire bride or something. Dorothea can just get stepping on out of here. Did you hear me, boo boo? I'm gonna sage in a minute and you're gonna be out of here. Clearly I am dedicated because I'm drinking coffee at 9.04 p.m. on a Saturday night. Welcome to my life, quarantine 2020. In all realness, I had like five videos pre-recorded and um you know things happen like ugh, the lighting i don't even know what i was doing to be honest i don't even know i don't even know what i was doing but i went and rewatched the videos and i was going to edit them today and i was like this is horrible it was horrible i had like a spotlight on my neck somehow i don't even know how i did that so i was like you know what it's fine it was a salem video anyway the other creeps and Cat uploaded a Salem video and I was like, you know what, let's not be like twinsies. I'll just can this video and um, do, do something completely different. So here I am doing something completely different. I thought it would be fun to sort of start a serial killer series on, I mean, yes, femme fatales, there's a few of those, and then also just women serial killers in general. Because I'm not sure if you guys know this or not, but serial killers, like I think it's 84% of serial killers are male and Caucasian. So today we're going to talk about Dorothea Puente, who was from Sacramento, California. She was dark, man. It'd be one thing if she would have been burying bodies of like her ex-husbands in the garden because mood Dorothea, that's a big mood. But she was killing um, people that were kind of like living with her um, as like a boarding house establishment. And I'm going to be using the ColourPop Smoke Show palette. I don't know if you guys have used this or seen it or maybe you've purchased it yourself. So this is the Smoke Show palette. It's all grays, darks, edgy, totally me, pretty cool toned, which I appreciate. I don't really like the warm toned gothy palettes because they stress me out. I, I like to like have my my pale gothy moments, you know what I'm saying? This palette from ColourPop is only like $12. I think most of their palettes are that price range, which is really, really great. It is a really good miniature dupe for the cremated palette by Jeffree Star. So let me touch on this for a second. This is the cremated palette if you haven't seen it. It was like a $65 palette. I purchased it with my own money. We all know Jeffree Star has all kinds of darkness going on around him. It's hard for me to promote a product for somebody that has such a terrible history and background. Um, but I'm not going to get rid of the products that I've I've spent my own money on. Um, and I'm going to be honest, actually, this this is the only gothic dark witchy like giant palette that has been made so far <laughs> just wait till my line comes out but um because of that you know i do i like the colors because this is this is like an everyday palette for me but it's hard to promote somebody um you know that has the problems that he has which is why i haven't been able to use this on the channel yet so i guess you know i'm not gonna promote it but by your own discretion like if these are colors you think you would use um, this for me was a $65 palette well spent and I obviously purchased this before all of the ugly stuff came out online. The only thing I'm going to say about like YouTubers and, and like YouTubers that have issues, for me personally, and this goes for not just Jeffree Star but like everybody, like Jacqueline Hill has had drama and um, you know, everybody's had drama. I don't follow their whole life stories. So like... On my other channel, some people would come to me and be like, why are you talking about that person? Didn't you know they did it? Did it? No, I didn't know that because I don't follow every single thing Jeffree Star does. I don't follow everything James Charles does. I don't follow everything that Jaclyn Hill does. That's not my life. I'm busy and I work all the time. Before you come after me or anyone for that matter, how do you know this YouTuber knows anything about the drama that's going on. I hate drama, to be honest. I know that like the Jeffree Star thing is racist related, which is very, you know, contemporary casual with what's going on in the world right now. And that's inexcusable. But I don't, I still don't follow his life. And I don't want to because I'm like the anti-social goth girl that just like doesn't care what people are doing with their lives. Okay, now with that being said, 
let's just let's just get started shall we first of all my allergies in vegas have been so bad because all of the horrible wildfires that are going on right now in california are just like floating right over the bend to us little las vegans and it's been hard to breathe it's been really smoky and i just hope everybody in california who's helping fight the fires stays safe. So normally I would go in with like a eucerin lotion, but I'm not gonna do that today because it's already nine o'clock at night. So I'm gonna start, this is one of my favorites. It's by Wet n Wild. It's Photo Finish Rose Multi-Use Oil. Um, it has actual rose petals inside of it. I've used already almost a half a bottle. So I actually just put some in my hand, about maybe a quarter of a dropper, and I warm up the oil. And I'll use this as a base. Now not all oils are the best to be using for your skin. This one in particular does not cause breakouts, thank God. But I think because of the wildfires and like the ash, I think my skin has been really dry as of late. So I always let that seep in, whether it's like the eucerin I'm using or sunscreen, whatever, I'm gonna let that seep in first. I'm pretty much addicted to the um, Milk Hydro Grip uh, Primer. I don't really use a lot though just because I do have oily skin. Okay, so my skin color has changed a lot this summer. Um, it always does by August and that's because I'm in Vegas and it's hot and I've been driving around with the Jeep top off and that's made me tan. So I, oh by the way, the Juvia's Place full coverage um, foundation and concealer, before it was causing breakouts I wore it a few more times just to test it and it did not cause me breakouts so just thought I'd let you guys know so I did go and buy some elf a couple of darker colors so I'm gonna test and see which one sort of looks the best or maybe I need to mix a couple of them I actually think I'm going to mix these two normally I wear the palest shade right now I'm wearing I'm gonna take medium it's almond and then I'm gonna take some sand I think light ivory because some of these have a little bit of peachy tones in it. I want it to be canceled out just slightly. So I like this. Um, this is probably my favorite foundation over the counter that you can buy. Um, it's not super overpriced. I think it's like $6. It's by e.l.f. It is the Flawless Finish Foundation. I like that it's pretty full coverage, but it doesn't feel heavy on the skin, so I do wear this sometimes. So since it's nighttime, normally I don't do this. I also feel like that just wasn't quite enough full coverage. I think I'm going to grab the 16 hour camo concealer by e.l.f. in Fair Warm also. I just have a little bit of like darkness still in here that I kind of want to cancel out. Yeah, that's better. I like the brightening. So I'm going to take Tarte Shape Tape, and this is Tan Sand for my contour. Since I am a little bit um, darker than normal, I'm just going to do the cheekbones and the jawline. And then a little bit on the forehead. The difference between like a powder, bronzer, and a liquid one or like a cream contour in my opinion is... The cream and liquid are a little bit more intense of a bronzer than just what the powder would be. And I just feel like I kind of need something to offset it since I am so tan right now. It's very like glowy, right? I'm gonna add just a little bit more of this pale concealer just to make sure I... Now I'm gonna take Fenty setting powder in butter today and I'm just gonna set the whole face. I swear I think I heard a woman cough in here. So maybe that's Dorothea, I'm not sure. Dorothea, are you here? Oh, I got a breeze on my face. So for today's creeps and cosmetics, before I start, I need to come up with kind of like a color scheme. Um, I mean, obviously I'm going dark, which I'm so thrilled about, by the way. I love it. Maybe I should just do like every other video dark. I hope I could accomplish that. Um, I think I might go for maybe a little bit like modern twist on like a Taylor Momsen vibe. What do you guys think? I think I'm gonna be kind of like all over the place. I might mix some colors, you know, just get crazy. So with my coffee at uh, 9.37 at night, who's ready for some creeps and cosmetics, huh?
Dorothea, Dorothea, Dorothea. Oh, I mean, honestly, when you look at her picture, you're not going to think she was like this serial killer. Like, she looks like this sweet little old lady who would, like, bring you a pie if you were her neighbor next door. Um, and who would have known she would have been sort of dubbed the Garden of Corpses serial killer. You have to admit that's kind of a cool name. Like, I assume in the afterlife she's like, mm-hmm, that's right, that was my serial killer name. Remember, women are not usually serial killers, so this is very rare to be talking about a woman and, and a little old lady. Like, it, you know, my mom, like, does not like to be called old, and my grandmother did not want to be called an old lady. Like, that was a in my family. I'm probably going to carry that tradition on. Like, that was just considered extremely disrespectful in my house, so I feel really bad calling her that. But it is interesting, like at her age, she would be able to kill these people and drag their bodies all the way outside, dismember them, whatever she did, put them in the garden. And she did it over and over and over again and nobody caught on. I mean, I guess if anything, at least she gave them a proper burial. I mean, maybe that wasn't so proper. But I mean, some serial killers just like, you know, throw them out in garbage. Like, it's nice that she put them in soil, ashes and ashes and dust to dust. Dorothea Helen Puente. Born January 9th of 1929. So that's interesting. That's about the same time that my grandmother was born. She did pass March 27th of 2011. So let's chitty chat about Miss Dorothea. I'm just making sure this base is like good to go. So the murders, the alleged murders, took place in the 80s. And she was basically the owner of her house. And what she was doing was she was renting out rooms to different people. So you could technically consider it like a boarding house, right? So now the sad part about this is that she was starting to murder disabled and elderly people. Now that's, that's sad. So clearly she knew that these people were vulnerable. She was probably offering them low rates for them to move in. They probably didn't really have anywhere else to go. So that's kind of sad, you know, like to take take advantage of people's, you know, age and like their their handicaps. Like that's just sad cuz I've had both elderly people in my family and family members suffer from, you know, having disabilities. So the reason behind her actually killing these people was that she was taking their social security checks and cashing them and she was basically living off all of this money that she was making from these people being murdered and Obviously the state didn't catch on, they just kept sending the checks and that was sort of the end of it. How many did she kill? It was nine confirmed cases with six unconfirmed cases. The newspapers went wild with her headlines and they dubbed her the quote, death house landlady. That's a nightmare out of your dreams. Like nobody likes to deal with their landlords anyways, but now you're talking about somebody who's like got some serious violence going on. Yeah, that's, that's pretty terrifying. So I'm building up the colors. So I started with the white and went in with this light gray and now I'm going in with this one. This one's a little bit harder to build, but that's okay. I'm just being patient. So January 9th of 1929, little Dorothea was born in the Redlands of California. So you have to admit, like, it's a given when you know about a quote serial killer that like something sparked them in their childhood, right? Like. There's usually some sort of unresolved trauma and it made them, you know, sort of act out, unleash on people, which is just really sad. Because, I mean, I think everybody has trauma, you know, realistically. Like, obviously, some people is probably worse than others. But, you know, when you're a child, you don't control the trauma that happens to you. So it's not your fault when you're a child. But... When you're an adult, it is fully 100% your responsibility to fix your trauma because now you're, you're in control of your life. So you can either sort of let it take you over like some of these serial killers or you can do something about it. So unfortunately, Dorothea was, you know, not any different than any other serial killer we know. And she came up with a pretty traumatic childhood, which really is sad. Because I think anyone, not that I'm sympathizing with a serial killer, but, but in a way I am, just in a sense of the anger and hatred that they have taking out on these people is really more of like a shadow of 
who they are on the inside and probably how they feel on the inside or you know I, th I think some of these people when they do these crazy serial killer events I think they're acting out like a performance they would want to be doing on the people that hurt them I think it's like they finally feel like they are in control when as a child if there was any sort of abuse going on they didn't feel like they were in control so they sort of turn the tables and in a way they're just reenacting what happened to them because as a child they were innocent going through this abuse and now they're an adult reenacting abuse on another innocent and it's just it's really sad that karmatic cycle has to end like that it has to end her mother Dorothea's mother was a um, sex worker a prostitute whatever you want to call it and her dad um, had tried to commit suicide in front of her. And then to throw something else edgy into the mix is that they both um, had an alcohol problem. So once again, just think about being a child and seeing all this dysfunctionalism going on. You have no control over it. And it's just, it's gotta be so traumatic. I can't even imagine, you know, like it's just so sad. And then to grow up and not fix and resolve that trauma now you're carrying it around forever and of course it's going to rear its ugly head in, in certain ways. So are the parents held responsible? 100%. Is she held responsible as an adult to fix her own? 100%. So in 1937, her father actually ended up dying of tuberculosis, which is crazy because that was a big thing at the time, right? TB, you would have to... In fact, my grandmother, um, they thought my grandmother had it in that time frame. And they ended up taking my grandmother away because it, they, they were afraid she was going to give it to other people. And they ended up putting her, like locking her up in an institution for like six weeks until um, they thought she was safe to come out. So I remember my grandmother just having some trauma from that. She didn't end up having tuberculosis, by the way. But as precautionary, if you had it or not, even if they suspected it, they would force you to go into like sort of like hospital housing and you kind of had to quarantine like today, like what we're going through with coronavirus. Except back in the day, technology and science wasn't where it is, thank God now. And it was a lot worse because my grandma, I remember her telling me it was a very sort of secluded event that took place. So now, as if that trauma wasn't bad enough with her parents, like she's witnessing them, they're still your parents, you know? Like, once again, I'm gonna go back to the conversation of everyone has trauma. Some people's may be worse than others. You shouldn't, you know, be comparing your trauma and trauma bonding with other people. But as an adult, it is your responsibility to unfuck yourself. And so what ended up happening was her dad died of tuberculosis in 1937. And then her mother died in a car wreck the following year. So she was literally left orphaned. And on top of that, it had just been this huge dysfunctional mess. Um, even before the orphan thing happened. So now she can't even like grow up and get answers from her parents. Which unfortunately, I'm going to be real and say that. If you've suffered any sort of trauma, I mean, I even have as a child, not obviously as bad as hers, but you're never going to really get that resolved with your parents anyways. But she probably thought if she got old enough, she'd be able to talk to her parents about the things she went through and, and she couldn't because they both died. So basically, um, she ended up as an orphan and she was put in, you know, like the foster care system. And that's when her abuse started. She, she was being passed around from houses and she ended up um, getting sexually molested as a child. So now th here's a kid that is just really messed up. Let's be real, if she's a child in an orphanage system or, or you know, the, uh, what you know, if she was in California, this is sort of the same system that Marilyn Monroe was in, which she also was molested as a child in the system. So that just means the system is also failing these children, right? I wouldn't doubt that it's still even happening to this day. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, I know people that are trying to adopt kids in the system. I tried to adopt Hannah and it's a mess. Like it's a, it's not easy. They do not make it easy. The states do not make it easy because it ends up being all about the money for the children, right? You get more money per child for fostering from the state. You get like free medical health insurance and like food stamps monthly than you do if you adopt a child 
then it's all your responsibility. So people enjoy fostering kids because it ends up being like maybe $5,000 a month per kid or, or three to 5,000 a month. She was probably just being passed around and thinking about how that felt till she was finally like of age 18 to basically just be on her own. This is sort of bringing light to quote what we know as serial killers, you know, like it's just sad. Like there's usually a reason that they're like this. It's not like they just woke up one day and got violent. I mean, I'm sure there's some that are just bad eggs in general, but I think for the most part, these serial killers usually stem from some really dark places and their family has failed them and the system has failed them and they've never understood what strength is. And because of that, now they can't come out of this like dark shadow that they've been in pretty much their entire life. I'm trying to decide what to do with the inner corner here. I guess I'm gonna have to go with silver because nothing else really makes sense. I'm gonna try to dip into a little bit more of this other shimmer. I love the shimmers from ColourPop, but they really don't work unless you use your hand and your fingers. You have to sort of press the pigment in and it works better if you already have like a base like like I have that you're building up. So I'm gonna go in with Starstruck, which is a super silver color. So anyway, back to Dorothea. She's probably feels like just society in general has failed her. And you know, over time, that's gonna cause you to grow a cold, hard heart. And you're just not gonna care about anyone. You're not gonna value what life is, and especially your own life, you know, like, we all need to learn to love ourselves first, but she didn't know what that meant. My camera got super blurry there for a second. Dorothea Boo, are you in here? How am I telling your story so far, hmm? 1945, she married for the first time. She was 16, she married a soldier named Fred. He just returned from World War II. So now she's getting thrown into a situation with someone who probably is suffering from shell shock. She ended up having two kids between 1946 and 1948. And then she ended up sending one of the children to go live with her family in Sacramento. She ended up placing the other child up for adoption. We're already seeing some habits of karmatic circles going on. It's what she went through. She didn't think she could parent appropriately, so she gave her children away. Which, to be honest, if she had this many demons and she's murdering people and, and planting them in her garden, it was probably the best bet for her children to have the best life they could without her. In 1948, she got pregnant again, and she ended up suffering from a miscarriage. And uh, that same year, her husband left her. Probably, once again, right back related to she's probably fighting a lot of demons. Not too long after that, she ended up forging checks in California and she got caught and she ended up serving a year sentence um, for forging checks. Soon after that, she found a guy that she barely knew, ended up getting pregnant, had the baby, and once again gave the baby up for adoption. In 1942, she got married to a Swedish guy who was named Axel. And this was the beginning of a very long, turbulent, out of control relationship for 14 years. In the 1960s, she got busted for owning and operating a brothel. Wow. Um, I mean, I can't say much about that because living in Vegas, those are actually legal in Nevada. They're not in Vegas, but they are in Nevada. She was in and out of jail several times over this period. And uh, the crazy part was, was that um, at some point she ended up, she just kind of became a criminal. And then she started working as a nurse's aide. And this is when she started to work with, um, you know, handicapped and uh, disabled elderly people. She also decided it was probably a good time to start her dream boarding house situation, which is sort of where we know her as. So in 1966, she finally divorced Axel and then she remarried once again. This is when she adopted the name Dorothea Puente. His name was Puente and he was from Mexico City. That marriage though only lasted for a couple of years before they divorced. Now this is when we take in the famous house that's located in Sacramento, which is a three-story six-tomb, which is a three, which, which, 
There was a three-story, 16-bedroom home that's still to this day located at 2100 F Street in Sacramento, California. In 1976, she would be married a fourth time to someone named Pedro, who was a raging, violent alcoholic. This marriage only lasted a couple of months. So if you're seeing a trend here, it's that she grew up with, you know, a alcoholic father who tried to commit suicide, suffered from depression, probably mental illness, and she is now creating that karmatic cycle within her own life. She probably has some daddy issues, right? Where she has that emptiness hole in her heart, missing having um, a fatherly image or a dominating male in her life. And she keeps finding toxic mail after toxic mail after toxic mail. So now she starts going to bars. She's looking for older men than her to date um, because they have money. She's looking for the ones with money. And what she would do is she'd get to know them and she would take their checks and she would fraudulently sign their name. She ended up getting 34 counts of treasury fraud, but she wasn't sentenced to jail this time. She was only sentenced to um, probation. She's constantly repelling what she needs, right? Which is money. She's constantly money laundering in all of these different ways. Um, in my opinion, especially money is one of those things, like the more you chase it, the further it goes away from you. And the more that you think positive and abundance and like I will receive money, the more the universe hands you what you need. And she kind of is proof that if you don't have what you need and you try to like find it, it's going to keep getting further away from you. And if you have what, you know, the ball of yarn that the cat wants, it will find you. So some people started moving into her house saying she was a mean landlord, that she would, um, their checks would be missing from, you know, in the mail, their mail would be missing, she would take their keys. Others would say she was a really nice little old lady because she would like make meals for them and like very like housingly gesture-like. With the amount of people that she was killing, she was getting about $5,000 total a month is what the police totaled when she was caught. So April 1982 is basically when the first murder started to happen. I'm trying to decide what to do on the lower lash line. I think I need to do some I think I'm gonna go in with this flat black and then add like an actual silver glitter on the bottom. I have this, I have this silver glitter by NYX. So I think I'm gonna do that. I think I'm gonna get like dramatic on the bottom eye. 61 year old Ruth Monroe started to um, rent the upstairs from Dorothea. But soon she died from an overdose of cocaine and Tylenol. Puente told the police that she was very depressed, the woman, because her husband was terminally ill. So she basically staged it to look like a suicide. The police did rule that an accidental suicide and at the time, Dorothea was not held responsible for it. A few weeks later, the police arrived back at Dorothea's house. There was a 74 year old that was also living with her and he called the police over because he accused Dorothea of trying to poison him. He also accused her of trying to drug him and steal money from him. On August 12th of 1982, she was convicted of three charges of theft. So after her five year sentence, she started writing pen pal letters to this guy that was from Oregon. He was retired, he was 77 years old and uh, they became very close while she was in jail. And uh, he was basically waiting for her when she got out of jail um, and he picked her up and they started to make wedding plans. In 1985, uh, Dorothea hired a guy to come do some housework for her on her home. I'm gonna read this so that I get it correct. She wanted to install some wood paneling. Um, she was gonna pay $800 for labor and she was also gonna give him a 1980 Ford red pickup truck, which she said belonged to her boyfriend that was in Los Angeles and she no longer needed it. She asked him to build a six by three by two foot box to store books and other items. And then she asked to, f to transport the filled box, which they both agreed to do. Mm, I don't think that was for books, Dorothea. Let's get real here, boo-boo. That was for your 77 year old boyfriend's body, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. For my inner corner highlight, I have this, I don't even know how to pronounce this brand, In-Ignult, I-N-G, Ignult, L-O-T. Um, this is the shade, it's a loose pigment in AMC. It's a real cool, like purpley, it's real weird. I'm gonna use it as my inner corner, um, just cause I feel like it's very like alien-esque. 
So they left to take the box after she filled it up with, quote, books. And on the way, wherever they were going, she asked him to pull over, which is the handyman. And she said, there's a river embankment here. Just drop it off here. And, you know, there's nothing in it anyway. It's just junk. Just throw it out on the side of the highway. I don't want to haul it anymore. So he did. He got out of the truck. He unhauled the box, which he thought was just full of books and like junk, and he threw it on the side of the river bend. On January 1st of 1986, there was a fisherman that was on the river bend who spotted the box. He told police that it looked a lot like the size of a body and he didn't want to open it. So police came out, they were dispatched, and there was a unidentifiable elderly man inside of the box. Everson, which was the guy who was from Oregon, he was getting pension checks and she was collecting the checks and she was cashing the checks even though he was dead by the riverbank. His family was also sending him letters, which she was getting the letters and responding to them saying that he was very ill and wasn't able to talk or communicate and she would be the liaison with, with his family. She is conniving, isn't she conniving? So for three years, his body remained unidentified. So the family didn't even know he'd been dead that whole time, still collecting pension checks. So I'm going to open up this glitter from NYX. There's a bunch, see how it's in the top? And it's like an eye, it's like a glittery eyeshadow, but it's not glittery enough for me. Of course it's not, you know. So I'm gonna take this little brush and I'm just going to apply it under the eye. And then quickly before it dries, I'm going to pick up some of the loose glitter and pack it on underneath it. So Dorothea kept taking more tenants into her house and she would typically be, you know, visited by social services because she would accept pretty much anybody. And so sometimes these people were, you know, ex-criminals or they had a mental illness. Maybe the state needed to see where they were living. And she also was known for once in a while taking in actual drug addicts off the street. I swear it sounded like I heard a woman go, uh-huh. Very like high pitched, uh-huh, uh-huh. So there was a guy that had been living there like kind of long term. His name was Chef. He was sort of known to the neighbors as her personal handyman. When Chef disappeared, people got really suspicious because people in the neighborhood just really loved him. November 11th of 1988, Police were asking about the disappearance of one of her tenants named Alberto and he had schizophrenia. A social worker had actually reported him missing. The police went to check the location out to see what was going on. They realized there was some disturbed soil and they dug up the soil and they found, they found him. They found disturbed soil on the property and they decided to look into the disturbed soil. They found a tenant who was 78 and seven other bodies on the property. She was charged with nine murders. Let me read who they were. Um, her boyfriend, who was ever since 77, eight tenants who lived in the boarding house, Ruth Monroe, 61, Leona Carpenter, 78, Alberto, or Bert, who was Gonzalez, he was 51, um, Dorothy Miller was 64, Benjamin Fink was 55, James Gallup was 62, and Vera Faye Martin was 64. Betty Palmer was 78. She was convicted of three murders and sentenced to two life sentences. Um, she was supposed to serve life without parole, but she did pass away in 2011 of natural causes. She wasn't a suspect because she was, you know, they thought she was this sweet little old lady. So she was actually 82 when she passed away. I think I'm gonna go with some black stones just because I feel like that was the color of her like stone cold heart. Do I look like a grieving widow? Cause that's, that's what I was going for. It's the look I'm going for. You know, it's interesting cause serial killers usually have a preference, right? So they'll, they'll usually do like, they murder men or they murder women or they, and I guess hers was technically like older people um, or they, or they murder children. Like she just didn't care, man. She, I mean, she, she, I hate to say this, but she was kind of weak sauce for picking on other weak people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't really think that goes for a, a true description of a serial killer. She preyed on the weak. Come on, Dorothy, girl, you need to find some Jesus ASAP. Okay, of course I'm gonna go with a dark lip, and um, if need be, I can always switch it out to a lighter lippy. Um, I have another gloss by Stilla, which is a super dark red gloss. So I think I'm gonna line, 
and then mainly just use the red Stila gloss. Oh, and if you're wondering, the color is Bonus Baby. This color, I'm gonna show you guys. It's very like, bam. It's actually like a really like maroony sort of red. I hope you can kind of see it better. I feel very like vampy. Like I feel like this should be my alternate ego of like, like a vampire bride or something. Something may still be missing. Just because I know you guys are going to ask me, this shirt is from Killstar. So the last part of this is talking about the haunting of Dorothea. Um, does she haunt still? Well, Ghost Adventures did go to the location. Um, I also wanted to talk about, I don't know if it's still going on, but the house that's still located in Sacramento, the people that own it for a while, they were allowing people to like purchase tour tickets in the home and you could go on a tour of like Dorothea's house and like sense things and feel things. I don't know if you guys remember the episode of Ghost Adventures when they were in Sacramento, but when they first showed up to the house, there were like weird mannequins outside and like sitting on the porch. I think that was because that's part of the tour of the house. I'm not sure if they're still doing it. So if you're interested and you live in the Sacramento area, hit me up and let me know. It does say that the inside of the house, which some of it that we didn't see, um, is decorated with costume signs, statues, mannequins that even resemble Dorothea. So talk about just resummoning in her entire energy back into the house, right? And when Ghost Adventures went, they did interview the, the lady named Peggy, who was like the 91 year old owner. Um, they obviously said that they were having all kinds of activity. So let me tell you guys. So first they had a couple EVPs. So the first EVP they received before the investigation started said is to die and you're dead. Michael and Jay both feel like they're choking on something. During the investigation, they got EVPs that said, I don't care, get out, growls. The spirit box voices came through that it was an unexpected male voice saying, hear me, Peter, hold me, and Jenny. There was physical harm to Zach. Zach felt lower back pain. The ovulous voices said, bury 15, earth and dirt killed, night and east. The paranormal puck received the words, Rhonda, count, below, Paul, under, trap, multiple, business, hell, spirits, digging, cement, pine, within, Anthony, Mandy, east, person, and foliage. The SLS camera did map a figure. So random facts about the property just that I thought were interesting that I wanted to bring out to you guys. The property sold for $560,000 on 831 of 2005. Apparently the property was up for foreclosure and it was on the market for around 300,000 by a company named MLS. So I don't know how recent that was, but apparently under that marketing like disclosure, it did say quote, Pop property has notorious history, um, must be disclosed. So I'm assuming that's because bodies were buried on the property. The FBI stats are 90% of the worldwide serial killers are males. 10% are female. 84% of all serial killers are Caucasian. Really interesting facts on all of this. So do I think Dorothea moved on? Well, I think if she did kill some people that were mentally handicapped in there, like with schizophrenia, they may not know they're dead, unfortunately. That's what we run into when you investigate asylums a lot. So that's really not fair that they were taken, you know, in such like traumatic ways and now they're trapped there in that like what I call the gray zone. And um, if you're looking at Dorothea, I feel like people that have serial killer tendencies that did stuff like this, they don't wanna cross over because they don't wanna meet their maker. So I'm sure she's for sure there, especially if they have, well obviously with the evidence that Ghost Adventures caught, but um, you know, if she does have that strong of energy where they're creating mannequins and replicas of her, um, it's it's kind of like a shrine in a way to her. So she probably just feels like at home, like she probably still runs that place. I feel bad for her. I feel like her parents failed her, the system failed her, um, and it was horrible what was done to her. But unfortunately, she shouldn't have been doing the harm she was to people, especially people that have mental illness and, and extreme disabilities. It's really horrific that there would be someone out there preying on people like that. And um, she should cross over to meet her maker so that she can heal because that's some dark shit that somebody could do to another human being, let alone maybe 15. 
I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Creeps and Cosmetics. If you did, please make sure you give my video a thumbs up. Please leave me comments below. Please also make sure you guys follow me on social media. Share my video if you don't mind because I want to spread the love of the channel since I'm redoing it. Any suggestions, I'd love to hear back from you guys. And as always, I will catch you guys next time. Dorothea can just get stepping on out of here. Did you hear me, boo-boo? I'm gonna sage in a minute and you're gonna be out of here.